Good morning, and welcome to God's house. What a great day it is to be gathered together. We continue our celebration of the season of Christmas this morning. Do let me remind you that this evening, 5 p.m., we'll have our New Year's Eve service as uh, much of the world celebrates the turning of a calendar to a new year. It's important that you and I remember that much more important than that is new life given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. So see you back here at 5 o'clock tonight. Before then, let's stand. Greet one another with God's peace and remain standing. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Unto us the Christ is born. O come, let us worship him.
Unto us the Christ is born. O come, let us worship him. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for this morning is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapters 61 and 62. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, chapter 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. From Luke chapter 2, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84 She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Please be seated.
Christmas, boys and girls. Did you know that December 25th may have come and gone the first day of Christmas, but it's still the season of Christmas? That's why we have our Advent uh, wreath out with all four candles lit, and we also have the middle candle, the Christ candle lit, because we've celebrated that Jesus has come. Now, speaking of Christmas, I have a story about a young boy named Jerry to tell you about. And maybe like you, a couple months ago, Jerry found out that Christmas was just around the corner. So he got out a pencil and a paper, and do you know what he did? He wrote down his Christmas wish list. And he wrote a few things on that list, but on the very top, he wrote down that for Christmas, he wanted a Spider-Man Lego set. And of course, there were other things, but this was the most important and what he really, really wanted for Christmas. And so he waited and he waited. He did his advent calendar and he did his pa uh, paper countdown advent chain. And he knew that with each day, he got just a little bit closer to Christmas and his Spider-Man Lego set that he really, really hoped for. And finally, Christmas Day came. So he ran down to look at the Christmas tree and under the Christmas tree was a box with his name on it. It was about the right size. And he thought, hmm, this could be my Spider-Man Lego set. And then he shook it. <gasps> Sounded like it could be Legos. But mom and dad had a rule that they could only open presents until after church. So he waited some more. And finally, they came back from church. It was time to open the presents. He ripped off the paper. And do you know what it was? It was his Spider-Man Lego set. Oh, and he was so excited. And he played with it all day. He built it. And anybody who was willing to listen, he told them all about his Spider-Man Lego set. <clears throat> then the next day, he played with it some more. But he got interested in some other things, too. And the day after that, he really didn't play with it at all. And do you know what he did the next day? He wrote his Christmas wish list for the next year. <laughs> Sometimes I do that, too. I'm so excited for a present, and I feel like I wait and wait. And it finally comes, and I'm grateful. But then... I kind of get bored of it. And I have another story about somebody else named Simeon. And his story is similar to Jerry's and also a little bit different. So let's listen to how it's similar and different. Now, Simeon is a true man in the Bible, and he also had a wish list. His wish list only had one thing. On his wish list, he wanted to see the Savior that God had promised. And so he kept his eyes and his ears, his heart and his mouth open, just like we did through the season of Advent, waiting for God's promised Savior. After many, many years of waiting, one day, Simeon was at the temple worshiping God, and he saw a young mom and a young dad and a little tiny baby who was only 40 days old walk into the temple. Could that be his wish list? Was it about to come true, the promised Savior? When he saw the baby, the baby was baby Jesus, and he knew that it was God's promised Savior. And he was so excited, and he held baby Jesus in his arms, and he said, my eyes have seen your salvation. He knew that this was the best gift, that it was God's promised Savior come true. And there was also another lady her name was Anna. She was 84 years old. And when she saw Jesus, she too knew that he was the promised Savior. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us everything that happened with Anna and Simeon after they saw Jesus. But I have a feeling that unlike Jerry, who kind of got bored of his cool Spider-Man Legos, I have a feeling that Anna and Simeon never got tired of worshiping Jesus. And they never got tired of telling about him because they knew that he was the best gift of all for them and for you and me. So boys and girls, while the season of Christmas may come and go each year, I hope you know that the sweetness and joy of knowing Jesus will never go away. Please fold your hands and pray with me. Dear God, thank you for the witness of Simeon and Anna. Help us joyfully praise you. Today and, Today and always. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's reading for this first Sunday after Christmas, we see a lovely picture, a lovely picture of some of the first people on earth to cross paths with the infant child, Jesus. Just 40 days after his birth, Mary and Joseph take Jesus up to the temple for the rite of purification. And there they will encounter righteous Simeon and the prophetess Anna. And in this brief encounter, in this brief moment in time, we learn so much about how lives will be changed by an encounter with the Christ child. I'd like to look at how encountering Jesus impacts the lives of everyone in our reading today and also consider what that story means for our own lives, how we should expect our lives to be changed by our own encounter with Jesus. As the text begins, we see faithful Mary and Joseph bringing their newborn to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Why? Because this was in accordance with God's law. The firstborn son must be dedicated. And so Mary and Joseph bring him, and people of humble means, all that is required of them is they offer a pair of turtle doves as a sacrifice. Our text ends by saying that when Mary and Joseph had performed everything in accordance with the law of the Lord... Then they returned to their hometown. Now, Mary and Joseph's lives were impacted by their encounter with Jesus in ways that ours never will, but in ways that many of us in this room are very familiar with. As first-time parents, they had all those typical worries, bringing home a newborn and learning how to care for him. They seemed so fragile. There were tasks to learn, diapers to change, baths to give. Gas bubbles to burp. They would put their infant child in a crib and pray for a few hours of sleep before the hunger pains and the cries began anew. But above all these tasks, Mary and Joseph, though parents of the Son of God, were nonetheless required to obey God. Their encounter with Jesus presents a duty before them. As people who are following the one true God, they must do the things God calls them to do. And so when we watch Mary and Joseph encounter Jesus in our reading this morning, we learn that those who encounter the Christ child in this life will have obedience to render. Of course, as people of God who followed Jesus after his death and resurrection, we are not called to obey the Old Testament ceremonial laws of Israel, but we do have an obedience to render. And while sometimes it seems so much different than those people in the Old Testament we encounter, it's, it's not as different as we might imagine. They, too, followed, for instance, the Ten Commandments. Those same commands still faithfully guide the people of God here, now 2,000 years later, as we seek to obey God. Encountering Jesus means we have an obedience to render, and that's not easy because these commandments aren't always so popular in our society today. Even Christians love to bend and twist God's word to suit their own desires so that we might imagine that we are obeying when, in fact, we're doing the opposite. Whenever I teach confirmation classes, I always, always give parents a couple weeks heads up before we talk about the fifth and the sixth commandments. Because these commandments deal with the application of life issues and how we honor life in our world and how we maintain sexual integrity before our God. And many things about just these two commandments, they push against the prevailing attitudes of our culture. Of course, almost everyone in our world agrees that murder is wrong, but despite what Jesus has taught us, not many would apply this commandment prohibiting murder to the anger that grows in our hearts each day. Few are willing to apply it to life as it exists in the mother's womb. Of course, the sixth commandment is even in more disarray. Society doesn't much care about adultery anymore. And that's partly because it no longer even agrees on what a marriage is. Living together, sexual activity before marriage, these things are sort of taken for granted these days. And even devout Christians, they might dare to disagree with their pastor if the matter involves their own children. But despite the fact that this is what our world looks like today, and it it looks different in every day, our encounter with Jesus calls us to obedience. 
We're called to faithfully follow God's commands and, and live in accordance with his will, despite what the rest of the world might think. We have an obedience to render because we have encountered Jesus in our lives. Next in our story, we see a picture of Simeon's encounter with the Christ child. Somehow, some way, God had let know, Simeon know he would not die before he beheld the one who had been promised to save God's people. I love how the text puts it. It says, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And when Simeon sees Jesus, his life too changes. Simeon sees Jesus and he knows that he has to give praise to God. And this teaches us that when we encounter Jesus in our lives, we have praise to give. Well, Simeon takes that baby in his arms and raises him high and says, my eyes have seen your salvation, the salvation you have prepared before all people. That's the words Simeon uses to offer praise that day. But what about you? You who have encountered the Christ child in your life, how do you give praise to your God? Certainly coming to worship today so that you could be in the company of believers and have God's word on your lips and the liturgy and hymns. That's one good way to express and to praise God for the salvation he has given you. Now, we rightly consider praise to be a voluntary response to what God has done for us. Ordinarily, it's best if praise does not need to be coaxed out of us. Jesus has conquered sin, death, and Satan for us. The, the least we can do is be in God's house and return his praise. But the truth is, just like our obedience... Giving praise to God is not optional for those who encounter Jesus in this life. Our own crossing of paths with this Christ child obligates us to render not only obedience, but also to praise his holy name our entire lives. Next, let's look at Anna. Anna was an old lady, 84. Sorry if I'm offending you, any of you in your 80s. Uh, she'd been a widow most of her life probably six decades or more if I read the text right. And what did she do with that life? Well, Anna, it says she dedicated her life to worship and prayer and fasting, and she never left the temple night or day. Anna, by all appearances, already seemed to be offering her obedience to God. She already offered her praise to God, and so we might wonder, how else could Anna's life be changed by her encounter with Jesus? But it does. When Anna sees Jesus, she not only gives thanks, but she begins to speak about this child to everyone who will listen. From Anna, we learn that those who encounter the Christ child in their lives now have a word to proclaim. Every Christian has a word to proclaim. We're not often very good at it. We might not often do it. But nonetheless, we have something in our lives that needs to be said, that needs to be told, that a whole world needs to hear. We have the saving gospel of Jesus down in our heart, as one of those old Sunday school songs used to say. But that word needs to find its way from our heart to our lips so that it can be told and proclaimed, so that others would know about this babe that came in a manger, about this Jesus who rose again, about a life that is to come. Anna told all who were present that day, and it's worth considering, who in your life might you need to tell? Your encounter with Jesus has given you a word to proclaim, and that means there is without a doubt somebody in your life to whom you need to proclaim it. Well, thus far we've seen what occurred in those lives of those who first beheld the baby Jesus, how his presence impacted and changed their lives. But to close, I want to look at the words Simeon speaks in this moment, because the words that come off Simeon's lips, they teach us about the lives of everyone who is going to encounter this Christ child at some point in their existence. What comes out of Simeon's mouth that day might sound like just a prophecy for Mary, but really it's a prophecy for us all. Simeon says plainly to Mary that this child he holds in his arms, this child is appointed for the rising and the falling of many in Israel, and he is a sign that will be opposed. 
And what that means is that every person who will ever encounter Jesus, their soul will rise or it will fall depending on what they do with that encounter. This means everyone who encounters the Christ child has a choice to make. They can either receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, or they can speak against this sign. They can oppose this sign. They can reject it. Now, wait a minute, you might be thinking, Pastor, I thought we were Lutherans here. I didn't know we turned into decision theologians. What do you mean we have a choice to make? Let me be clear. Don't call President Hagen. I haven't traded in my Lutheran card. I fully believe, as Luther wrote in the catechisms, that we cannot by our own reason or strength believe in Jesus or come to him. I believe faith is worked by the Holy Spirit, and we take no credit for it. I believe that the Bible teaches that apart from the Holy Spirit, nobody can say Jesus is Lord. But I didn't say we need to accept Jesus into our heart. I know that's not a choice we make. I said we must receive Jesus. When we're told the message of the great forgiveness that is ours through his death and resurrection, that is a gift, a gift we can gladly receive only by faith given by the Spirit. But what is true, and what is always true, is we can throw that gift away. We can turn our back on that gift. We can walk away from it. We can reject the free gift we've been given. So daily, it is our task to hold on to this gift. And you might think to yourself, but pastor, why would anyone throw something as so great as salvation away? It's because of what Simeon tells Mary next. He tells Mary these words. He says, a sword will pierce your soul. Now, he's likely referring to the reality that Mary will one day have to watch her son die before her eyes. And I have to say, that's probably the the deepest wound any parent can ever face in this earthly life is to have to watch their child die. But in these words, in these words, Simeon shows us another truth about our encounter with Jesus. Those who encounter Jesus in this life, those who have the gift and resolve to hold fast to it, they will have suffering to undergo. Now, it won't be exactly like Mary's suffering, necessarily. But the reality is, if we want to hold fast to faith in a world that opposes Jesus, then difficulties will come our way. When you feel like everything you hold so dear is so different than everything the world around you is saying, then you'll face potential consequences, even if it's only the alienation you often feel for others. This can make it so hard to persevere in the faith over a lifetime. But should we persevere in that faith? Should we hold fast, come what may? There's there's one more thing we can learn about our encounter with Jesus in our reading today. Simeon holds this baby high in the air, and he says words that we've come to know so well because we sing them so often in our communion liturgy. Simeon speaks the words of the Nunc Dimittis. He says, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Simeon knows that he can welcome his death Because he's beheld the Lord's salvation. And Simeon shows us that for those who receive Jesus and persevere in the midst of any sufferings, we too have a death that we can welcome. I know, it's not the best way to end a sermon talking about our death. Hard to put a positive spin on it. But the truth is, we will all die. And the truth is, for those who reject Jesus, death is something very much to fear. But for we here who gather in this place, this first Sunday after Christmas, for we here who have encountered the Christ child, our own deaths, whenever they might come, they can be something that we can welcome. Because like Simeon, we'll know that nothing less than paradise is in store. Not only on Communion Sundays and not only on this first Sunday after Christmas, but really every day of our lives is a day we can sing the Nunc Dimittis. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to your word. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand.
Please stand. O merciful Lord, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all. Grant us courage and strength to take up the cross and follow him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, we come before you praying for all those known to us who are struggling in body. We pray for Freya, for Tammy, for Jim, for Bob, for Jennifer, for Monty, for Michael, for Gary, for Ginny, for Larry, for Gary, for Randy, for Joe, for Allison, for Bud, for Bruce, for Jerry, and for Bill. We pray, Lord, that your healing hand would rest upon them, that they would be reminded always of the comfort of your presence and love. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us to serve them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also come before you today, Lord, praying a prayer of thanksgiving for all of our members who celebrate birthdays or anniversaries this time of year. We pray that you would continue to use them as witnesses in this world of the goodness of life lived according to your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also come before you, Lord, giving thanks, offering praise, as we who have received the great gift of Jesus, our Savior. We pray, Lord, that with that new standing, you would guide us to new life, a life guided by your word, offering praise before you, and bringing that message of salvation to all ears who would hear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen.